Ten years ago, Tisch Library opened its doors to the Tufts community and promptly established itself as a focal point for students and faculty by offering a wealth of resources, along with a wide array of programs and lectures. Throughout those years, Tisch Library has not only reflected the growing world-class status of the university, but has also been in the vanguard of the university-wide commitment to nurturing new leaders for a changing world. It is no surprise, then, that Tisch Library is the intellectual center of Tufts University, a library that, in the words of former President John DiBiagio, aesthetically, functionally, and technically speaks to the excellence of this university. Opening to rave reviews on October 10, 1996, students and faculty lauded the addition of new group study rooms and spacious reading areas. Others noted the innovative use of natural light, which illuminated previously dark corners and infused the library as a whole with a new vitality. And still others praised the architectural sensitivity of the new design to the overall topography of the hill. As we set aside some time to commemorate the past 10 years of innovation at Tisch Library, it is equally important to anticipate the future and ask what role Tisch will play in supporting the changing nature of research and teaching at Tufts University. From the very beginning, the libraries at Tufts University have supported generations of students by providing them with the skills to grow as intellectually curious and critically involved members of society with a lifelong commitment to learning. The first library at Tufts University was housed in a room at Ballou Hall and later moved to other locations on campus as the university grew. By 1908, the university obtained $100,000 from the Carnegie Foundation and built Eaton Library, one of the first college libraries built with Carnegie funds. However, even after an expansion in 1950, it was apparent that Eaton Library could not keep up with the increasing research needs of the university. With the completion of Wessel Library in 1965, Eaton Library concluded half a century of service to the Tufts community as its primary library. Named for President Nils Y. Wessel, who ushered Tufts into its second century, construction on Wessel Library began in January 1964, following a design competition sponsored by the university. Four Boston firms participated in the competition, with Campbell, Aldrich, and Nulty winning the right to design the university's new library. The final building proved to be a significant architectural departure from the more traditional designs that dominated the campus and marked the beginning of a movement to modernize Tufts' older buildings. Recessed into the hillside, it spanned 95,000 square feet and had a seating capacity of 800 and contained faculty studies, seminar rooms, the Mark Memorial Lounge, a reserve reading room, as well as significantly increased stack space and modern study facilities. Wessel served arts and sciences for more than 30 years, from the tumult of the 60s through the first Iraq War. Despite all these improvements, what architects and administrators could not foresee was the spectacular growth of the university into one of America's premier institutions of higher learning over the next two decades, and the rise of the Internet. These developments brought about rapid changes that would affect the future of Wessel Library. The pressure on Wessel Library started in the 1970s when Tufts began opening its doors to increasing numbers of undergraduates. By the mid-1980s, the student body had climbed to almost 4,400 students, more than double the student population in the mid-1960s. That growth spurt coincided with another one within the library itself. The library had almost doubled its staff by 1992. As a consequence of staffing needs, the original seating capacity had been reduced to 700, and students complained about the lack of space, 
particularly during finals. By the early 1990s, the situation had become severe. The annual senior class survey revealed that 69% of the class of 1990 was dissatisfied with the library and its collections. Administrators heard the student body and recognized the growing problems with the library. When we went into design development, we were presented with a standard that said you need to be able to seat a quarter of the residential population in the library at any given time. There were a constant stream of complaints at around reading period and exam time that the library was noisy, crowded, poorly ventilated, and ill-lit. And that was related to that little factoid. We had about 600 seats for a residential population of over 4,000 students. To say that we were cramped would be a dramatic understatement. Paul Stanton, Associate Director for Administrative and Technical Services. At the same time, the era of card catalogs and book acquisitions was drawing to a close, and the information age was dawning. With the arrival of the internet and increased computer functionality, yet with its stated structural lighting, and ventilation systems, Wessel seemed to be sorely out of date. It was reasonably clear that as the university had grown and prospered, we were outgrowing our library. Mel Bernstein, Vice President for Arts and Sciences and Technology. The stage was set for the library funds to be raised during the university's $250 million capital campaign between 1985 and 1992, a campaign which provided the perfect opportunity to clarify Tufts aspirations and bring together administrators, alumni, and current students under a shared vision. It was the students who first advocated for change. By October of 1991, a special 12 student committee to improve Wessel Library was formed and began meeting on a regular basis. They circulated petitions indicating their concerns about the existing structure and gathered 1,500 signatures to present to anyone who would listen. With the clear support of the student body behind them, they began meeting regularly with the Office of Development with the goal of gaining long-term financial support from alumni. The committee also brought their concerns to the TCU Senate which was looking for ways to help with the library expansion plans that administrators had already begun drawing up. These plans called for the doubling the size of Wessel by building underground toward the hill in front of Goddard Chapel. The expansion was scheduled for 1994, but the project was in serious need of money. It was the late Tufts president, Jean Mayer, who proved instrumental in not just articulating the issues facing the library, but also envisioning just what a world-class library might be. And he was then able to convince the Tisch family to put forth a challenge grant to help realize the goal. The Tisch family's response marked a turning point. The family, whose previous philanthropy resulted in a gallery in the Adekman Art Center, presented the university with a 10 million challenge gift, the single largest donation to the university at the time. Attached to the gift was an 18-month groundbreaking deadline. When you look at those prerequisites at any institution of higher learning, the focal point is usually the library. And when we looked at the current capital need of the university, clearly a new library was something that would coincide with Tufts position as one of the dominant universities in the country. Jonathan Tisch, Tuftonia, Fall 1996. Minor fundraising issues plagued the project until groundbreaking, creating some last minute drama. On March 1, 1994, the Daily broke a small story that the university had fallen approximately $5 million short of matching the Tisch $10 million grant. By March 4th, it was front page news, requiring a response from administrators. Both Library Director David McDonald and John Roberto, Vice President of University Operations, assured readers that they still felt confident in the ability to raise the money by the scheduled July 30th groundbreaking, and sizing down the project would not be an acceptable option. Ultimately, funds were raised, and the official groundbreaking for the newly named Tisch Library occurred in front of parents, students, faculty, and staff at noon on Friday, September 30th, 1994, Parents Weekend. 
University President John DiBiagio welcomed everyone on the President's lawn to celebrate the 21 million transformation of Tufts University. This is a defining moment for the academic and intellectual facilities at Tufts. This new facility will change people's perceptions about Tufts technology. Mel Bernstein, Vice President for Arts and Sciences and Technology, Tufts Daily, Monday, October 3, 1994. A ten-year dream for a superlative library was coming to fruition. The Tisch family contribution had provided the momentum for further fundraising and ultimately helped transform ideas into reality. The last to speak before the assembled crowd was Jonathan Tisch, who said the family donated the $10 million grant as a gift of affection to Tufts University and the generation of students to come. And as he reflected on his own days as a student, he summed up the mission of the new library. A library is more than books. It is a way to connect students and faculty. Now it gives students and faculty a method of communication with the rest of the world. Jonathan Tisch, Tufts Daily, Monday, October 3, 1994. From its inception then, Tisch Library was conceived as nurturing new leaders for a changing world by providing the technological resources and skills to reach out beyond the hill, to link to and make a difference in the wider world. As all the speakers put on construction hats and proceeded to dig into the topsoil, a first-year student couldn't help but comment. This is a great step in the right direction, and another asset added to Tufts' many other features. Joe Fiore, Tufts Daily, Monday, October 3rd, 1994. With the groundbreaking finish, construction began in earnest, and the architects from the Boston firm Shepley, Bullfinch, Richardson and Abbott began the process of building a new addition to the existing structure. The Wessel Library's departure from the traditional red brick 19th century buildings on campus had set it apart, making it an important design element to the university. Additionally, Wessel had been recessed into the hillside in an attempt to complement rather than dominate the natural landscape. This posed both problems and opportunities for the new design. We wanted to double the size and yet preserve the scale of the library in relation to the buildings around it. We wanted a building that wouldn't overpower the hill. It was a transitional form rather than an architectural focal point. Ralph Jackson, Design Principal, Shepley, Bullfinch, Richardson and Abbott, Tuftonia Magazine, Fall 1996. The new building would use a synthesis of existing and new materials to create a seamless integration between the existing library and the addition. The choice of Connecticut and Georgia granite as building material proved successful as their soft gray tones tightly integrated with Wessel's existing poured concrete and Indiana limestone foundations. At the same time, limestone banding and recycled fins throughout the roof line repeated Wessel's trademark and linked the two libraries. The idea of transitional form shaped more ambitious design elements as well. Dark and cramped corners were replaced with space and natural light. The proposed library entrance would achieve a new feel by adding a barrel vaulted ceiling lit by clear story windows. The new entry would also enhance both the functional and spatial experience of arriving by bringing services to the front of the library. As construction continued and the different design elements came together, the upturned ground and the constant noise of construction created new challenges. Work was arranged so as to minimize interference with library operations and students' schedules. Generally, demolition occurred from 8 a.m. to about 2 p.m. Assistant Library Director Paul Stanton encouraged the construction company to save anything ugly until intercessions. One of the most uh, interesting facets of the construction project for me personally and professionally was being uh, literally a translator uh, between library constituents and the construction project itself. So we learned in a hurry, for example, when, what noisy meant. And so when a construction crew says something will be noisy, um, that doesn't mean that it will be noisy to library patrons. That means that for library patrons, it'll sound like the world is coming to an end. Um, that construction project people tolerate a very high level of noise on a very quiet day for them. So it took a while to get them used to what was acceptable in 
the world of an academic library versus what would pass in construction. And one of the things that, one of the variables that became very important in that process was the variable that had to do with timing. So the calendar became an important variable for both the construction project and library patrons. So for example, when they had to grind the concrete deck literally 20 feet away from the reference desk, it happened in the morning during the summer, um, which was very stressful for the three or four patient, patrons who were anywhere near the uh, reference desk during that time, but it didn't affect the multitudes. On the other hand, we, it took a long time, but it, we finally convinced uh, the construction crew that during reading period, painting was a good activity to have happen because it doesn't make that much noise. And we got complaints, but not many complaints about painters being in the building. It was decided to keep the library open during the construction project, except for one two-week intercession. In order to accomplish this goal, the project took place in distinct phases. Full-scale restoration of Wessel did not begin until after the 80,000 square foot addition was completed, and operations could be shifted into the new space. The underlying principle was one of seamlessness, a seamless integration of the two buildings coupled with a seamless operational plan. The exception to this rule was limited access to designated stacks when small sections of the library needed to be restricted due to construction. When this happened, students would fill out a slip of paper in order to request retrieval from the stacks a day in advance and pick up their items at the circulation desk. Many were thrilled to finally witness the realization of a long-awaited project, and the buzz of excitement surrounding the first days of construction was palpable. Everyone associated with the library became caught up in the enthusiasm and ultimately contributed to the overall design. Uh, the whole staff was involved in every step of the planning process, right down to voting on furniture, upholstery, and carpet selections. And uh, people took these assignments quite seriously. In fact, whenever possible, input from the Tufts community was sought. The library committee consisted of faculty members, graduate and undergraduate students, and received copies of the construction project minutes. Renderings and an architectural model were on display for users to see. Examples of chairs selected for public areas were available during construction for users to test and comment on. A mild winter in 1995 allowed construction to proceed as scheduled, but inevitably disruptions occurred, and it wasn't long before students began noticing that the transitional form articulated by the design consultants seemed to also apply to the entryway, which would be relocated three times during the project. We got tremendously positive press throughout the life of that project. Um, the, only, uh, the only exception was right at the very end of the project when um, the uh, contractors, with, the general contractor was pushing to get the landscaping around the building done in time for commencement. So that coincided with those ugly time periods where it was reading period and so forth. Um, so we had a high volume, high foot traffic, and because you're excavating and landscaping around the entrances and so forth, you, the walkway in and out of the library changed almost daily for a period of two weeks. And uh, I can remember uh, we had a student who worked here who wrote about uh, the wooden path leading into the library and how for finding their way through the maze there should be a reward of a piece of cheese at the end. Uh, John O'Keefe was quite the character. By January of 1996, Phase two operations allowed students to reap some of the rewards of the new library as operations were relocated to the new addition. Up to 85% of the new portion was available for use, with the remaining 15% to be finished in March. If some students seemed to be upset by the never-ending construction, by commencement, the class of 1996 was lamenting the fact that they did not get the chance to enjoy the new library. The construction of Tisch Library was now 90% complete, and over the summer of 1996, 750,000 books and journals, as well as the contents of the chemistry, physics, and engineering libraries, would be repositioned in the newly furnished and enlarged facilities. 
Once again, a plan was drawn up to minimize disruption and ensure the collections were brought together seamlessly. The move was a rather complex one. It was made complex by the fact that we had to simultaneously integrate the books from the science libraries, chemistry, uh, engineering, math, and physics, into the main book collection, and in addition, to reorganize the bound periodical collection from title order into call number order. Our main criteria was to try to move everything only once. Indeed, by the time of its dedication on October 10, 1996, it was fully apparent what the new library would mean for students. It wasn't just about increasing space in order to seat additional students, but also to accommodate diverse learning and study styles. In Wessel, you have one spatial experience. Our approach gets away from the notion of a generic student and a universal space, that students are all the same and that their requirements don't differ. Ralph Jackson, Design Principal, Tuftonia Magazine, Fall 1996. The new facility expanded student group study rooms from 4 to 11 to accommodate the trend towards cooperative learning, while still providing for private study areas. Light natural wood carrels came equipped with outlets for laptops, and natural light poured in from nine new skylights. This is so much of an improvement as far as study space goes. During finals, there was always a race to get a group study room. It seems a much better place for concentrating. Eric Lee, student, Arts and Sciences, 1997, Tuftonia Magazine, Fall, 1996. Natural light also poured in from the new glass hemicycle, which gave wary students the opportunity to look up and rest their eyes with a view of the Boston skyline. Complementing the abundant natural light was an attractive, decorative paint and furniture scheme reminiscent of the arts and crafts movement. Behind these aesthetic touches, functional changes occurred as well. A new emphasis on service resulted in the reference and information desk assuming a central position while circulation was moved to the front of the entrance lobby. A new ground floor level of 25,000 square feet provided room for the physical collection to grow, while an increase of electronic network services and new electronic classrooms positioned Tisch Library at the forefront of the information age. Previously, students had only text-based access to resources, and now they can get images and sounds, a whole new range of graphical information, Technologically, compared with other libraries, we're ahead of the ballgame. Bonnie Pusselwaite, Director of Library Systems, Tuftonia Magazine, Fall 1996. Staff were also excited by the new building and showed tremendous flexibility, not only during construction, but also in adjusting to the new technologies that had been hardwired into the design of the library. Tish's forward thinking was also evident in the new media center on Level 3 with its two media classrooms connected to the university network. From opening day, these media classrooms have been some of the most requested rooms. Tisch anticipated changing technologies and student needs with its electronic classrooms and dedicated computers with internet access. Designed from the very beginning to be flexible and grounded in the dawning information age, Tisch Library was well prepared for the next 10 years and beyond. As we peer into the future to anticipate how people access knowledge, it is obvious that the library will continue to play a powerful part in how knowledge is sought, evaluated, and applied. Mel Bernstein, Vice President for Arts and Sciences and Technology, Tuftonia Magazine, Fall 1996. President DiBiagio, who had articulated the need for a world-class library to reflect the glowing reputation of the university, summed it up best when he said, As we prepare for the new century, which will be information driven, we are most fortunate that we have a library which can effectively deal with the challenges that lie ahead. Tufts University appreciates the generous commitment of the Tisch family and the many other contributors to the library project, which will assure our competitiveness in the future. President Di Biagio, Tufts University, Tuftonia Magazine, Fall 1996. In the 10 years since Tisch Library opened its doors, it has managed to remain true to the original vision of a library designed for the future by embracing changing trends and increasing its relevance to today's students and faculty. Since that time, 
Tisch Library has become a repository of art, the poems of John Holmes, the first Tufts poet, and the university's one millionth book. Tisch also currently spans approximately 175,000 square feet with a seating capacity of 1,250. Hosts numerous author talks sponsored by Friends of Tufts Library, providing students, faculty, and staff the opportunity to hear contemporary authors discuss their works. Has a computer classroom that is outfitted with 15 computers in which library staff conduct hands-on demonstrations and workshops on library resources and library research skills for over 100,000 classes each semester. Has recently added the Tower Cafe, providing a social space for students and faculty to interact beyond the classroom. Provides study spaces, tables, oversized chairs, group study rooms, electrical outlets, and wireless internet access. Recently added two collaborative workstations, including large monitors, wireless keyboards, and mice for group projects in the pilot learning commons in the reference area. Houses the state-of-the-art digital collections and archives, which provides electronic access to rare books, manuscripts, artifacts, and university archives. Has three designated quiet study rooms. Contains 24 media carols, which may be used to view media on a walk-in basis. Provides instant messaging reference service and reference email that has a 24-hour turnaround. Contains a map room that includes a geographic information system center with 15 PCs to map spatial data. Open during student hours. The weekday hours are from 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. with the Hirsch reading room open for late night study until 3 a.m. During reading period and finals, late night study is open 23 hours a day. Is a charter member of the Boston Library Consortium, allowing Tufts students access to any of the 19 libraries in the consortium, which collectively contains over 32 million volumes. Leads many of its peers in the acquisition of electronic resources, which now number over 200 electronic databases and 15,000 instruments. Provides laptops through an innovative lending program for Tufts University students. Was selected in 2006 as the only Massachusetts host of the Forever Free exhibition, a highly acclaimed NEA-sponsored traveling exhibition focusing on Lincoln's quest to restore a union divided by civil war. Ten years ago, Tisch Library opened its doors to the Tufts community and established itself as a world-class library for the 21st century. It continues to do so through the dreams and hard work of friends, students, faculty, and staff. Although it is unclear what the future of information management may hold, it is certain that Tisch Library is strategically poised to meet the challenge. When the um, building opened 10 years ago, um, we had all this potential. We had a great new welcoming facility. We had uh, improved collection. The question was, what would happen then? And uh, the students started coming right away and um, have used it in ways that we had not expected. And we've been um, moving to meet their needs uh, ever since. Recently, when the um, task force for uh, undergraduate experience uh, said uh, that the uh, library was the intellectual center that showed that we fulfilled the promise of uh, uh, what I think the library should be. You can have a library and not be the intellectual center, but um, I think what we tried to do is, as we were building the library, as we were um, planning for the library, we, we got out of the library. We started talking to all the faculty. We started talking to the academic departments. What are your needs and how can, what can the library do to help whatever you're doing? And uh, then we started talking among ourselves what we can do 
that wouldn't be in the classroom that we could provide, like exhibits, like author talks. We want to provide a, uh, a variety of intellectual stimulations for them, uh, intellectual activities for them. And um, so I think that's, uh, I think we've been pretty successful on that. The senior uh, survey that's done every year uh, now indicates that the library is the most essential service and the one that they're most satisfied with. I'm, I, they're also satisfied with lots of other things, but um, it's really nice because we have uh, been taking this uh, survey and we've been trying to respond to them. Uh, and I think that's why the satisfaction's gone up. That's why they say that uh, we're a really important service. Of course, when you plan a building, um, and it's 10 years later, of course, things have happened that you had no idea. Um, we didn't have any clue that Google would be coming along, how much everything would be uh, electronic today. Um, um, but I think we've been pretty good at um, uh, uh, anticipating, at least so far. Celebrating the completion in, of uh, Tisch Library on October 10th, but a library is never completed.